If Pokemon was rebooted, would we finally get an official world map? What would it look like? For this first episode, I want to stress a particular point about this journey into game design that I think demonstrates the spirit of what I am doing here. Whenever I hear a conversation about Pokemon doing a reboot, remake, remaster, or whatever, I typically hear the same grievance. Restarting from the beginning means once again retelling the same first story set in the same little canto, with the same little boy beginning his adventure in Pallet Town. However, rebooting doesn't mean we have to go back to the Kanto region again, we've done that enough. A reboot means we can throw away everything established in the previous games to create a new world, however we want. A reboot is the chance to completely redesign the map. Elements of old areas and characters can make a return in an entirely refreshing manner. Don't think it can be done? Just look at The Legend of Zelda. They reboot all the familiar elements and locations almost every single game. As each Pokemon title came out, development was treated like a sprint, especially for the first couple of games. A developer for the first generation, Ken Sugimori, said, I didn't think the series would continue for so long. I figured there might be a part two, and that would be it. So you can understand why it's perfectly reasonable that each Pokemon game was only concerned with its own history and environment without much considering its place in the world. For a reboot, we know now that the Pokemon franchise is less of a sprint and more of a marathon. Places, people, legendaries can all be mentioned long before a game actually features them. The benefit here is that it creates the feeling of an interconnected world larger than us that we get to explore one piece at a time. Plus, who doesn't love a good cameo? You might ask yourself, why is this guy looking into the world map of Pokemon? Clearly it's not important when you make one of those games. I respectfully disagree. Making a more fleshed out and consistent world can be more engaging for older audiences. Just see my video about why engaging adults is so important for Pokemon. Mapping out this world is just one part of building that consistency. Just quickly, I want to make a note here. World building is an incredibly complicated creative endeavor. If you really want to build up a deep history to a world, you have to take everything into account. Culture, religion, geography, resources available, economics, politics, and much, much more. Throw into the mix fantasy creatures that will impact on every single one of these things, and it quickly becomes overwhelming. In fact, I want to direct you towards the YouTube channel Hello Future Me and his video called On World Building Dragons to see how complicated it is to invent a world that has just one powerful species in it. Then, think about how much you would have to consider and how daunting it would be to put in hundreds of magical creatures. He puts a lot of good questions forward. Just swap out the word dragons for Pokemon as you follow along and you are well on your way to seeing the breadth of the creative endeavor before you. Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to go through the exercise of creating a detailed world map and taking into account all those complicated elements. Such a deep dive isn't necessary to see how we can make the lands of Pokemon work in our favor. That said, I will be looking into some world building just so we can ask ourselves the right questions. As designers, one of the biggest factors is that we want to be able to future-proof the games. We need things that are new, interesting, and different for generations to come. Curiosity about places to explore and find Pokemon is a goldmine for player retention. So let's fill out our design criteria. <laughs> What do we want from this world? We know that we want to have thousands of these magical creatures across the planet. We know that we want to be able to explore unique places that will allow us to see a mix of them new and old as the series progresses, and sometimes just purely having new Pokemon on the roster. We also know that wherever we go, it will usually require a fairly solid population of humans so that there are trainer battles available. One of the core spiritual elements that the developers at Game Freak have expressed in the past is that the world of Pokemon is a peaceful place. There are no wars or starving homeless children. However, there have definitely been wars in the past, so developing a history that gets us to this point is going to be important. Another element to consider is whether the Pokemon world is a copy of our own. There are references to real-world places found randomly in theirs but that is likely just a byproduct of the development cycles acting as sprints and not marathons. Lieutenant Surge is known as the Lightning American. Raichu has Pokedex entries that say its electricity could knock out an Indian elephant, and Arcanine apparently has a place in Chinese legends. 
Should the games continue to have references to our own world, or only stick with theirs? You can note that most of these references happened in the earliest generations, although a lot of the designs for locations have always been heavily influenced by our own world. Kanto and Johto are Japan, Alola is Hawaii, Gala is Great Britain, etc. Do we continue to base regions on real-world places? Doing so allows for familiar cultural structures and processes. On the other hand, we also have the opportunity to design completely unfamiliar landmasses and oceans, give or take the familiar cultures. This unfamiliar lands design also allows us the chance to create very alien setups as well. How far do we want to explore that opportunity? Pokemon itself sits in this mixed up in-between. All of the places are definitely fictional, all the maps and landmarks are made up for their game, but there have been holograms of a planet seen in some of the games that look identical to Earth. We've never officially gotten a world map from Game Freak or the Pokemon Company showing us how and where all the featured regions relate to each other geographically, which makes sense. If you never give the players a world map, then you can fill it in and expand it however you want, forever. Now, moving forward for the rest of the design study, I'm going to choose to create a unique world. We definitely had the option to have it be a copy of our planet. I think that could even be very interesting in that case to really lean into it. Create new cities around landmarks you can find in our world that otherwise don't actually have cities there, and vice versa. However, this is my design study, and I believe I will have more fun thinking about an alien world. The Pokedex and conversations with NPCs will now have references that are confined only to their world, their own lands, cultures, and animals. Oh, wait, animals. Are there animals in the Pokemon world? Let me just Google that. Okay, yeah, nobody else knows either. That is another detail that needs to be solidly established. Are Pokemon completely taking over the fauna of all environments? That is a whole nother conversation for another video. I'll talk about ecosystems next time and get back to drawing maps here. We don't need to make this decision now anyway. Okay, to recap our design criteria, Pokemon are everywhere, people are everywhere, and somehow they all get along fine. Our land and history is unique and self-contained. So, imagining a blank ocean planet, we could splatter some land about it, and we can definitely take inspirations from Earth here. The majority of land masses could be in the northern hemisphere, with some bleeding over to the south. The north and south poles are wonderfully frozen over, and of course, plenty of island chains with some of them located in the big blue, and others dotted around those bigger land masses. And then, to vary out the environments, we have to consider life's most influential factor, the weather. After all, you only exist due to the top six inches of fertile soil and the fact that it rains. If mountains grow too tall near an ocean, it will create a rainforest on one side and a desert on the other, just like Madagascar. Having long flat plains joining water creates swamps from the persistent mud. Now that we've gone through and figured out what biomes we want where, let's sprinkle human civilization all about. Usually this would mean cities near rivers or towns with farmable soil. But in this world, anywhere that might not seem like a good idea to have a city built because of extreme conditions or lack of resources, we actually have access to a resource that could counter those problems. Pokemon. Too cold? Bring fire types. Too hot and dry? Water types. With a reboot, you can invent a Pokemon that could address any challenge. More interestingly though, it can work the other way around. Pokemon might be the reason why a place could be uninhabitable. Well, we were going to set up on this lovely plateau, but the forest next to it is filled with ghost and poison types, so let's not. Now that we have people, let's give them a history. How did these people get where they are and have the relationships that they have with everyone else? If we want certain places to have particular cultural likenesses to our world, then their histories, resources available over time, wars, and possibly religions need to be similar to get that outcome. Really, you can copy and paste a lot of our history and alter it to include heavy influences from Pokemon, but it is equally fun to think up new things too. And just to tangent here for a minute, history, separate from world building, is its own incredibly complicated creative endeavor. Of course, these two concepts are linked and you are not beholden to do them in any particular order. You could even write the story for your game before even touching any history or landscape layout. 
But just so you know, I am completely brushing over a whole and entire beast of a concept here. I would happily recommend yet another great video from Hello Future Me on this topic, but I'm going to move on. Again, such a deep dive isn't necessary at the moment, and even if I wanted to, we haven't yet begun to explore all the things we need to keep in mind when creating that history. As such, whenever I can during an episode, I'll mention a little note about history for it. I think that is enough of general outlines, let's get to the meat of world building. We want our players to have fascinating locales to catch Pokemon in. Oh wait, my mistake, now I have to address the type chart problem. Since there are 18 types that any Pokemon could be, you almost have to have 18 types of biomes just to justify them all being in a relatively small map. Sure, there is plenty of crossover, bug and grass type can share a lot of biomes, same with rock and ground, but if you want at least 3-5 to five Pokemon of each type, an average of over 70 Pokemon, there's only so much we can cut it down to. So what do we do, put a beach next to a frozen tundra that has a cave that leads to the desert? I think that would kind of suck if every game did that. It would probably get boring or messy. Okay, I won't leave that statement there by itself. A good enough counter to this problem is a sprawling, interconnected map with multiple points of entry and lots of optional areas. I think Ruby and Sapphire did this really well. But Sword and Shield did not. They were a very linear experience with clumsily connected biomes. I can talk more about the design workarounds later, but the short of it is, we have those handy dandy teleport pads featured throughout the games as well as possibly rejigging the type chart. So for now, we can get back to designing whatever fascinating locales we want without fear of it feeling unnatural. We can design fanciful places with impossible features because having magical creatures in the world will influence the ecosystems with equally interesting results. We could have a desert by day that explodes into a labyrinth of giant mushrooms during the night. A sprawling cave system where the bioluminescent floor dwellers promote the growth of an upside down forest on the ceiling. Uh, how about a city that sails the ocean on the backs of leviathan sized creatures traveling the world? Or what about floating rocks? They're cool, right? I could go on for a while. Or we could have a world more similar to ours, just like how the current Pokemon games are. With how long Pokemon could last, it could even go through a number of reboots and try a few different levels of fantasy in its world building. What do I want to go with? Probably something in the middle, although since I'm not actually designing a world map here, it doesn't really matter. I've asked all the questions for this part of the journey, and the rest of the topics probably don't require these details to be set in stone. Hopefully, I've demonstrated enough for you to see how much is needed to go into fleshing out a world's map. I really believe that Pokemon would benefit from having a planned out planet and cultures with interesting histories. Pokedex entries can make references about locations we have yet to visit and give a glimpse to histories and cultures we can look forward to seeing in future generations. There is actually a lot of lore to be found in the world of Pokemon, but to better engage older audiences, it could probably be tightened up a bit. Like I said, a reboot is the perfect time to plan for a marathon. Thank you for watching. Let me know if you like the idea of Pokemon having a world map that we can get to explore over time, instead of just being given disjointed parts of the jigsaw. What ideas of landscapes inspire your imagination and desire to catch Pokemon in? I'll be going into so many different aspects of Pokemon's designs beyond world building, so be sure to like, subscribe, hit the blossom, and if you feel so inclined, leave a comment below. I want to discuss people's feedback and ideas to my videos as this series continues into the future. Now, go and be wonderful to each other. I'll see you next time.